Okay, I think we've got a nice full room. Uh, oh, there's Beth. Yep. Got it. Yep. Are we ready? No, yeah, she's going to introduce you. All right, I'm going to do a quick introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Porter. I'm class of 2006 at Wells, and I know a lot of you. So, hello, nice to see you. Um, we will be recording this tonight to put on the college's YouTube page. So just so you know, and you're welcome to have your camera off if um, that's something you're more comfortable with. And we're going to do questions and answers at the end. And I'm going to do a quick introduction of Claire. And I also like to, oh, sorry. I'm also going to do a quick um, uh, our Cayuga land acknowledgement. Um, so this is something the college passed a few years ago in 2018. They read it before events. And um, it is just, Wells College recognizes our collective responsibility to acknowledge our colonial history. This land is the traditional land of the Cayuga Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Wells College commits itself to ensuring the traditions and culture of indigenous peoples are embraced and reflected upon in order to engage in solidarity with the Cayuga Nation. And this is approved by the Wells College faculty in May of 2018. And now I will give a little brief introduction to Claire Morehouse. I'm so excited to have this um, session back, Learning by the Lake. We're doing it on the second Tuesday each month. So keep an eye out on our Facebook page and our website, alumni.wells.edu, if you want invitations or send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, so here we go. Claire's background as a sixth grade science teacher really has little to do with this styles and stories, but early work at Cornell in housing design and freelancing as an architectural portrait artist are contributing parts of her background. She is a longtime member of Aurora's community preservation panel and during the shutdown of the COVID winter of 2020, she needed a project. So this presentation and book were born. So thank you for being here and looking forward to a great conversation and presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wrote this book, and if I can make it go down, I'll do that. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, one time. We'll just try this quickly. It's all good. We just got to find it once more. Why did it disappear? Here. Where did it go? You've got to scroll down to get okay. it again. Nope. There. Uh, that one. Perfect. Okay, now click this. Use this one. That one? Yep. You sure? Yes, I'm positive. This one is Yeah, this will give you full range. Okay. Uh, I wrote this book uh, during the COVID time and I had a lot of help. Judy Furness, the town historian, lent me materials so I could work from home. And Dr. Linda Schwab, the village historian, read the text and made some suggestions, was a great deal of help. Uh, my editor was Ann Matheson. And uh, we're awfully happy to share this with you tonight. Once I got my work put together, I took it to Rob Lamascolo's beautiful studio and Rob put the book together. So he is a 09 graduate of Wells, the first year that men graduated from Wells. And he will explain what he did with my text and my pictures when I got them to him. But I wanna take you back 10,000 years ago there were people here who left their firestones on the beach. They've been carbon dated. 
And these people were hunter gatherers who wandered in here after the glaciers had just formed. Them. And I'm sure they were as intrigued with our sunsets as we are. We know much more about the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, uh, and thanks primarily to Lewis H. Morgan, who grew up here and was fascinated with the Indian stories and wrote the first book that is uh, accredited to anthropology. He is known as the father of anthropology and his stories of the Cubas are, are valuable to us. Now the Cuga longhouses were very much like this longhouse right here, which is actually Seneca and is over at Victor. Um, the Cuba villages dotted the shoreline of Cuga Lake. They were destroyed in September 29th of 17, 79, on the directions of General Washington, who sent two generals, Clinton and uh, Sullivan, up through the lake country with thousands of men, this was not a small brigade, to destroy the Cayuga villages and drive the people from the land. The Cayugas left, they fled to their trading partners, um, either in Niagara Falls or Canada, hoping for protection. There was very little to give them. Uh, crowds of people know very much like people moving today out of Afghanistan with nothing, hoping to survive the winter. The winter was brutally cold and many, many of them died. The land, about a hundred and, no, I'm sorry, uh, a million and a half acres were di was divided up into townships. The townships were divided into lots. And these were about 600 acres apiece. They were, there was a lottery. And for revolutionary soldiers who had not been paid, um, they received a lot, an allotment of land up here in what had been the Cuga Nation's country. Many of them didn't want to come into the wilderness, but a lot of them did because they were so impressed with the crops that they had seen growing and that, that they had to destroy. And so some did come, but the ones who did not sold their land and it was hot. Um, this was just uh, a land grab. Land speculation, lawyers were needed and uh, many congregated in Aurora. Now, or the land that was to become Aurora. This was warmer than some of the rest of the land and the lake was beautiful. And they came in as neighbors for each other, built good schools for their children. And many from New England came too. Uh, from, they were the, the New England friends Whaling was beginning to phase out. They could see the writing on the wall. They looked at this area and thought, aha, commerce is going to be a big growth area. And these people too valued education. Let me get that off. And uh, brought with them strong beliefs of tolerance and temperance and opportunities for women. Now, this is an artist drawing of what they think Roswell uh, Franklin's cabin looked like. Captain Roswell Franklin came in here in 1789, was the first to build here. 19 men arrived from within a 50 mile radius to spend two days building it. Professor Temple Holcroft explained the process. The frame for each part of the building was fastened together while lying on the ground with its foot on the part of the foundation on which it was to stand. Then liquor was brought to bear on the problem of raising the frame. When the normal strength of the men had been properly augmented by that of the liquor, the frame went up like magic and was fastened into position by the carpenters.
Now these two buildings represent what the early homes essentially were. They were boxes. And if they were wealthy, they had a foundation of stone and a floor. If they were not, it was a dirt floor, but the, essentially it was a box that was built for them to be protected. The salt box, and you can read these. I'll give you a moment to do that. I refer here to bays and to stories. Uh, the stories are levels of rooms downstairs and rooms upstairs. And the bays are a section that either has a window or a door. Usually these were beginning houses and they may have been added to each other uh, later by other people who uh, took over where these people moved out into something that was grander. Now Patrick Tavern is our oldest building in the village. It too is a box. It is two stories high and three bays wide started out as a tavern, was a tavern for many, many years. Um, obviously, the front door is not used now. The, the entrance is in the back. The building is currently a order in and take out farmer's market on Tuesdays. And two weeks ago, a perfectly lovely art exhibit and party were held in its backyard. Now we're moving on to Jethro Wood's house and I have to show his plow because Jethro Wood invented it. And it greatly improved agriculture throughout the country and, and Europe. And we'll take a look at his house. This is a federal house, a perfectly lovely example. And I'll show you why. No, I don't want you, I want you. There, uh, a federal building also is a box. And these had been extremely popular in Europe and in the colonies up until the time of the, of the Revolutionary War. Uh, this is one that is greatly trimmed. The late Georgian uh, had much more trim than the early Georgian. And by this time, there were dentals all along the roof and there were windows were trimmed above and below and there were uh, 12 panes in each window because that's where, that's what you could make at that point. You couldn't make any bigger windows than that, any panes of glass bigger. After the war in the United States, people didn't want anything that had to do with the English. So this was deemed English and this was the new way to build a house. The trim was all around the door. There might be a fan-shaped window or an eagle over the front door. Uh, side lights are, are glass uh, panels either side of the front door. Those were fine. But otherwise, we were not to desk decorate these buildings. And here is Jethro Wood's 1807 house. A beautiful example. Note the side lights by the doors. And otherwise, this is amazingly simple. The interior is elegant, but very sparse and, and very, very beautiful. The same with the, with the staircase elegant in its simplicity. And you wanna think of the tools that were available to carpenters at this point. They amaze me. Uh, here the fireplace is carved in the sunburst. This was wonderfully accessible. We have small ones at the side. And the basement. Basements are fun with old houses. Here you see one of the beams still has its bark and the other one has its bark and has been cut with an ad. Love these basements. 
Now, Aurora has a number of beautiful federal homes. These are all old, and the oldest ones are the simplest. The pilasters, which are those faux columns that are attached to the arches on the top, are really unusual in federal houses, but they're not unusual in Aurora. Uh, builders learn from each other, and th this is surprising in this village. Um, you take a look at the window. We have a sunburst window up here. The door has its lentils. Uh, and uh, this, little, this little portico over the door. Simple house. And the Jedediah Morgan house initially was the center part of this building, the three-story part. And again, it has the pilasters and uh, a beautiful, simple doorway with the side lights, uh, which is somewhat diminished by the little porch that's been added. The manse, great example. Uh, look at the sunburst above the window in the center of the second story. Very simple front door. Really no ornamentation, but wonderful balance. We're getting farther away from the war and people are beginning to dress their homes up a little bit more. Ryford House has ornamentation beneath the roof line. It has its sunburst window up there and this an arch over the door. Take a look at the side lights. Now the face of this house is stucco which accentuates the pilasters. The sides, however, are clapboard. And our last one, the Peter Fort House, 1819. And again, this like the last one is a little bit more decorated. Some of the same features may well have been built by the same person. And the porch was added in the 1920s, much to the chagrin of the professor who lived there and really, fought hard to keep that porch from being put on because he said it ruined the federal appearance of his home. And the Peter Otis house is down the road. It's south of the village a bit, but it has such a great history that I have to tell you. And the people living in it now uh, gave this, this story to me. This house with its splendid doorway stands on Route 90 opposite the Ledger Road and it was built for Elysia Carter and has this tale. The lime for the mortar was burned in Lime Kiln Gully on the property. The bricks used in the house and the outbuildings were made in Brick Kiln Field, also on the farm. Limestone for the foundation was quarried in King Ferry about four miles south. The lumber that eventually found its way to this house, all virgin white pine, came from a forest in Schuyler County that's between the south ends of Cuga and Seneca Lakes. It was hauled to Ithaca, loaded on a barge, and was headed north to some unknown market when the barge broke loose in a storm and washed ashore on Rocky Point, about two miles north of the house. Carter, after making a payment of $100, retrieved the cargo and with a yoke of oxen drew the lumber to his house site where it provided all the lumber needed for his home. Now the wood carving in the interior was done by a local craftsman who quote, spent one whole winter carving the parlor woodwork. Now I want to show you this, this is important. This is a page from a book that was available to wood carvers and carpenters in 1824. This is one of the first books that gave any help to any of the builders, other than what they learned from those who, to whom they had been apprenticed. So this is a step forward toward architecture as we know it now. You know, I can't, aha, here we move toward Greek revival. And again, read what is in the red box to yourselves.
and know that columns were a major, major addition to this architecture. The short side faces the street. So this was good for narrow city lots. It had the gabled roof. It had uh, windows that were, uh, again, many small panes. And the front door was surrounded by side lights. And often there was a, a transom light above. And these houses sprung up in the countryside, but our main one in Aurora is Taylor House. Taylor House built in 1840. And there it is in all its glory. Everything is outsized. And I'm sure this was designed so that it would be a landmark for people going by on steamboats in the lake. Steamboating was big business at this time. And uh, there were many that went up and down the lake each day. I'm sure they all looked at this and thought, what a grand house. The interior dining room was added on in 1870. Samuel Mandel, then the uh, master builder of Aurora, oversaw the construction. It was designed by a New York architect and a copy is made, it is a copy of a Florentine dining room uh, that they so admired. And then we went into Gothic revival. And you want to realize that these styles overlapped each other. I've always thought architecture is a little bit like dogs, maybe. Um, we can have purebreds or we can have combinations and you can see the styles of, of architecture blended as just as you can see traits and dogs blended. The gables are centered, they're paired, they're narrow and uh, the windows are sometimes grouped together. Most Gothics have porches and the pointed arch is the hallmark of this architecture. If everything is done in wood, it's known as Carpenter Gothic. Now in 1845, the Van Buskirk House, which may be one of a kind, was built. It is built with cobblestone walls. And that's highly unusual. Notice the pointed arches, obviously and all of the fancy porch work. Scroll saws had just been invented. And so carpenters were capable of doing this carpentry design in ways that they never had before. The cobbles for this house were not just ballast cobbles. Um, they were sorted. And Greg Van Buskirk, who had grown up in that house, remembered uh, playing with the sorting boards when he was a child. Uh, the closest matches are in the front of the house and toward the back where it might not even be noticed, uh, there are some little pieces of limestone worked in when cobbles had been used up. Here you can see the amazing work done with these stones. And also appreciate the, uh, the gabled, uh, the pointed uh, arches. And then we move on to Pettibone with its wonderful lacy scroll work, those great pointed arches, combination of wood and brick. I, this is just a fantastic uh, example of Gothic architecture. And inside you see the same accentuating the pointed arches in the windows and the doors. And wherever possible and appropriate, fancy plaster work was applied to the ceilings and the cornices of the, of the interior rooms. And here I want to take just a little bit of a break and explain 
this, the role of the two Samuel Mandels because I became quite infatuated with these two men who built most of what we see in Aurora. The father Samuel Mandel arrived in the village in 1812. He came from New Bedford, Connecticut. Um, I've often wondered because the British were, were Shanghaiing young men there, if he as a builder might have been a prize and he escaped before he was run off with. He came here, he knew people here, and right away he was accepted as a fine builder. In 1817, he built this Leffingwell house uh, named for the doctors who were longtime owners. Currently, this is the Aurora home of Pleasant Roland. And it was the first brick house built in the village. The bricks came from the car yard uh, between Union Springs and Aurora, and the limestone had been quarried in Union Springs. All these materials were brought down by barge and put together on site. Um, the Burnhams were the lawyers who owned this at the time, at the new time. And in 1845, they wanted a law office across the way. So this was built by Samuel Mandel for that law office. And I've, I've always appreciated this very balanced little building. It's just attractive in a very simple way. Now, most of that father Samuel Mandel's work has disappeared. Uh, he put a lot of houses together, as I mentioned in the beginning, and uh, those buildings have been moved or, or are gone. But his son, Samuel D. Mandel, apprenticed with him, was educated in New York, worked in Kentucky, worked in uh, California for two years, and in 1850 returned to the village because his father sent a letter saying that there was good work to be done in Aurora and that he should come home. This is the likeness of Samuel D. Mandel, which is in the um, United Ministry Church. And here we have Henry Wells. Henry Wells came to the village in 1850. He used to take the steamboats to Ithaca because of business. And he would tell captains of the boats or anyone willing to listen that he wanted to build a house right there. And he pointed to land that was part of John Morgan's farm. Eventually, he, he uh, negotiated with Morgan and did indeed build Glen Park on that land. And Glen Park is of the Italianate revival architectural style. And take a moment to take a look at these characteristics. We had two major varieties here. The cube is far more common, um, square buildings with a cupola. The more elaborate ones have the towers and those uh, towers and, and the cupola are to be seen in Glen Park. There it is, and I wanna show you its current. Whoops. I'll go back to this one. Um, the walls are stone, they're lined with brick, and then lath and plaster are on the interior wall. This allowed the house to be kept cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And the house was all completed when Samuel Mandel returned to the village, except for this circular staircase that the builder honestly did not know quite how to accomplish. Samuel Mandel knew the formula, a mathematical formula that works out for something like this. It is a four-story circular staircase, one of the most beautiful that you'll ever see. And there is the house as it stands today. 
an elegant, welcoming home. The interior is as elegant as the outside. The, uh, this, this marble fireplace corner is in one of the student rooms upstairs. This is a hall upstairs. And there's the main hall with the side lights, the transom lights. And again, wherever it was appropriate, uh, good plaster work of surrounding light fixtures and windows. And I'm putting the three churches together because Samuel Mendel built them all. Uh, this was designed in, uh, in, by a New York architect, but Samuel Mendel oversaw the construction. And the inside is, this is a Gothic building. The inside accentuates the pointed arches. And this, the windows have their own story. The building was complete. It was ready to be consecrated and the windows were not there. There was a lot of communication back and forth where were the windows and they arrived the day before the church was to be dedicated. The men of the village, quote, carried the windows to the church and installed them by moonlight so that the building was ready for the next morning. Just go there, if you would. Um, now, St. Paul's Episcopal Church was built in 1871 and was designed by Samuel Mandel as well as, as uh, built by him. The interior, which we could not get in to take pictures of because it's a private residence, but it has wonderful black walnut uh, beams and it had black walnut pews that were designed by him but made in Michigan um, when it was in the, as a church. And St. Patrick's Catholic Church I had a different beginning. This plan was in a book called Churches, 10 Churches for Small Congregations. And the Bishop from Rochester picked out this particular plan. Samuel Mandel built it. And the Bishop came back to consecrate the church one year after he had laid the cornerstone. The interior has always seemed so peaceful to me, just unpretentious and beautiful. And then we came into Queen Anne architecture. This was very fanciful and balloon framing gets us away from the box. And Queen Anne buildings could sprawl, they could, they could go in any direction. They had turrets, uh, no, no facade, was undecorated. There were loads and loads of spindles and really anything was appropriate for Queen Anne. And the one I'm wanting to show you is Mandel House, which Samuel D. Mandel built for his family on the same lot that his father's house had been on and that he had grown up in. You see, when he came back to Aurora, he really didn't go anywhere else. He was the master builder and the house is currently being redone by two architect builders, just as Mandel was, and it will now be apartments. And one of these two brothers had always wanted a pink house. So Mandel house, which is Queen Anne, anything goes, is our pink house. Inside we have fireplaces with uh, European tiles. We have stained glass that in the afternoon, rainbows play on the floor. More beautiful fireplaces, one in every room. And we get into Tudor buildings. And these were big, many gabled. Um, they were from really uh, introduced at the World Fair where there were buildings that architects had won prizes and submitted their plans and those buildings were established there. And we're dropping to back to 1868 
with the original Wells College main building. Now this was Wells gift. It was known as a seminary for the education of young women and it offered the same curriculum as that taught in men's colleges at the time. Tragically, 20 years later, it burnt, this building burned to the ground. So because of that, this is the oldest building on campus. The little laundry did not burn. And the big building, which housed the 75 students, the faculty, their classrooms, their libraries, their music rooms, all of that was gone. Are you leaving? I don't, I don't, we're almost done. With this. Um, Morgan Hall was a gift uh, from uh, Mrs. E.B. Morgan uh, to the college. It was in honor of her husband and it once upon a time was much more of a castle than this. It too burned in 1928 and when it was rebuilt with the same bricks, it uh, is not quite as castle-like as it had been. And the current 1890 Wells College main building was an upgrade. It was not built, it was not designed by Samuel Mandel, but he did oversee the construction. This housed 100 students and the faculty, had gym, a gymnasium, it had bigger libraries. Everything about it was state of the art for a woman's school and put Wells right at the forefront of women's education. In 1898, Henry Morgan thought the women needed to be on the lake more. And so the boathouse was constructed for them. And in 1899, Louise Morgan Zabriskie built the opera house for the village. It's, this is a great example of the Tudor architecture. All those dormers, the, uh, yeah, can't think what it is, but it is, a great example. And the interior shows the opera house on the third floor, the library on the second floor. And I will turn this over to Rob Lamascaro, who will show you how I, he took my pictures and the print and turned it into a book. All right, well, thank you very much for watching the show. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually put the book together, as well as a little bit of background about uh, what I do at my shop. So this is my shop. I'm located up on the corner of Moonshine Road and Route 90. So that's just about a mile up the uh, Route 90 from the college. So what I do, um, it's kind of four main things, although I dabble in a lot of things, but uh, essentially it's classical design, letterpress printing, book binding, and teaching of the book arts. So I'm very pleased to say that this semester I'm back at Wells College teaching the letterpress and uh, bookbinding courses in Morgan Hall for the Book Arts Center. So this is inside the shop. Uh, these are primarily letterpress printing machines and equipment and some bookbinding equipment that I use in my work. One of the great things about being here in Aurora and something I get a lot of inspiration from is the wildlife. So this is my friend, um, Bunny outside. Um, you gotta show it. Can you see the slideshow? 
No. No. Uh -oh. It's still it stuck on Claire's. No. It's not working. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sorry. We'll see what's going on. <laughs> Okay, can you see a slideshow now? Yes. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. Our uh, helper set it up and ran away, so I thought it was fun. Okay, so this is my shop again. Can everyone see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is up on uh, Moonshine Road, right here in Aurora. This is inside the shop. And this is where I left off. This is the uh, bunny right out the back door of the shop. Um, this is another woodland creature that we have here in Aurora, a little red-breasted nuthatch in my hand. And he served as the inspiration for a card that I did. So this is a drawing that I did and then I printed uh, using my antique presses this image. Here's another piece that I did that was inspired by the flora and fauna of the Finger Lakes. So we have a uh, red squirrel and various other critters that are around here. And it's accompanied by a Shakespeare sonnet. This was for a show that was over at the uh, Bodleian Library, University of Oxford. And it's very difficult to do anything with a lot of colors using these older techniques and technology. So you can see that this piece actually had to go through the press uh, eight times altogether. We've got an example of seven of the runs here. And here's a close up. So how did I get started with all this stuff? Uh, it started right here in Morgan Hall at Wells College. I was a student, as Claire mentioned. I started in 2005. That was the first year Wells was co-ed. Fell into the book arts by accident. Just thought it sounded interesting. Uh, really liked it. Did the book arts minor and eventually went on to get my master's in book arts from the University of Alabama. So once you do that, you need a press if you want to be a printer. So this is the first press I got. Uh, this press weighs uh, 7,000 pounds, came all the way from Oklahoma. So I got the press, now I'm ready to print, but not so much. There's a lot that goes into getting to that point. So this is what the press looked like when I got it. It had not been run in decades and it took months and months of restoration work to get it working again. Um, so this is what it looks like now. And I've printed several uh, large projects on this press. Uh, here's the, uh, we're delivering another press. This one weighs about 3000 pounds. So moving them is always quite a project. Uh, here it is safely in the shop being positioned. Uh, this is the oldest press that I use uh, in my shop. This one's from 1899, so really, um, contemporary with some of those older homes that we looked yeah, at. Yeah, you should see this. This is like a guy who has all these, he does, makes books. So this came from Book Interlaken, arts. which is on the other side of the lake. He's showing all these old machines that he got into his shop. So this is working on restoring the various parts. Obviously it was all rusted and caked with dirt and had to be cleaned. Uh, these are some of the parts after they've been cleaned. And here's the press now as it looks and gets used. And it's just a wonderful little press. You have to collect a lot, a lot of other things besides the presses that aren't made anymore. Now, this is ink. This is actually uh, offset ink, which is used for modern commercial printing. And it works OK for letter press. Sometimes you have to modify it a bit. Uh, by adding things to it. Uh, oil cans, that's something I wasn't expecting would be difficult to get, uh, but because there are a few machines that require oil cans anymore, getting a 
good oil can is a difficult uh, thing to do. So those are all used ones or vintage ones. There are a lot of small little tools that are really, really difficult to find. These are little pins that are actually used to line up the paper on the press. So um, they're extremely important because you need to be able to line up your sheets of paper on the press, but they're not made and they have to be found and they're difficult to come by. Your mouse came and ate the rest of the cookies. <laughs> so this is a um, furniture cabinet. All those little pieces of wood are actually important. They're used to fill up the areas that actually don't print. So that has a purpose. Here we can see um, some metal type down in the lower half, the lower corner, left hand side, and then it's been filled around with those pieces of wood because we can't allow things to fall over in the press. They have to be supported. Here's some metal type. Uh, so traditionally, all books were set or printed from metal type. So each individual letter is its own little piece of metal and you're actually setting those one at a time. Um, so this is not the technique that I used for Claire's book, but I just wanna show some of the things that I do. This is a solvent can. Um, these are really difficult to find the traditional solvent cans. This is probably late 1800s um, and it's used to clean the ink off the press or it's used to hold that solvent and uh, they clean up just beautifully because they're brass. Okay, so bookbinding must be easier than printing, but that's not exactly true either. So here's a uh, U-Haul full of bookbinding equipment that I got. I was very lucky to get pretty much the entire contents of an 1880s era book bindery, um, which is important. I, the binding work I do is all hand work for the most part. And at this time, hand work was still being done, but it was beginning to move more into machine um, done work. And I really like to do the hand work. So uh, this was a great find. Uh, and I'll go through some of the heavier machines used in book binding. This is a little paper cutter. It's a guillotine style cutter, so it can cut a whole stack of paper at once. Um, this actually came out of a little print shop in Aurora, New York. And I found it at a junk dealer in Auburn and had no idea where it came from, but someone had tied a little note to the bottom of it saying it was from Aurora and uh, it actually is. And was able to find some descendants of the printer and they confirmed that it was. Uh, this is a copy press. Um, these are great for book binding. You have to have something to press the book so it can dry without warping. So if you find those at antique shops, um, they're great things to have for book binding. Uh, this is a foil stamping machine. This is used for doing the gold titles on books. So again, another very difficult to find machine that's kind of necessary for this kind of work. Another big paper cutter uh, for use for cutting the heavy covers for books. Again, late 1800s, early 1900s machinery. Um, this piece is actually labeled 1885 and this is used for supporting the books with the rounded spines. If you've seen older books that have rounded spines, um, they were hammered in a device like this originally, hammered to shape. So these are some of the sewings that these were all done by hand. This is what's a underneath a lot of old book covers. They look like this if you take the covers off. Uh, here's a book that's in process. Uh, here's the top edge of a book. It has that decorative band on the top. That was hand sewn on this particular book that's being restored. Uh, some of the tools that are used for making leather books. Here's a new leather book that's being bound. When the leather's wet, it can be shaped. And it takes a lot of skill to do this. End sheets, so those are the decorative sheets on the inside of the book. Here's a finished leather book that I've done. So as soon as you're a bookbinder, people start bringing you old books that need repair. 
So a lot of times people say this is a treasured family heirloom and they bring it in a garbage bag, which um, is always a bit distressing being the book binder. But most of the time they work out, this is an old family Bible that was stored in a basement. And here are some examples that show the before and the after. This is Cuga County history book, which tends to fall apart. They just weren't that well put together originally. Here's another before and after, and another before and after. So, now I'm just gonna talk very quickly about the process of putting together Claire's book. So the way that worked is Claire uh, gave me a Word document. She emailed it to me where she had typed out all the things that she wanted. And then it was my job to make that into uh, what looked like a real book and to oversee the production and to bind the books together. So we had to think about who the end um, product had to go to. So we had certain cost constraints that we had to consider and those dictated the size of the book and how we produce the book. So this is just an example of uh, what a designer actually does. And this is all designed in Adobe InDesign digitally on the computer. So on the right side, we have the actual title page for the book. And on the left side, you have essentially what you would get if you just use Microsoft Word and use the default typefaces. Um, so I think the one on the right, uh, a lot more compelling. And, you know, a lot of people wonder why they should bother hiring a professional designer. And they say, well, I have all the tools to do it on my computer so I can do it myself. Well, you can get all the tools and supplies you need to build your own home at the Home Depot, but um, you may not feel qualified to actually do it yourself. So the same is true with um, something like designing a book. So this actually shows uh, one of the spreads of the book in Adobe InDesign. Um, that's how all the layout and arrangement is done. We have the text on the right and the pictures on the left. So Claire took a lot of the pictures on her cell phone and a lot of them were a little bit crooked because it's hard to hold a cell phone perfectly straight. So those have all been straightened. And I found a lot of the old photographs that are used in the book. A lot of them we can thank Bill Hecht for. Bill Hecht, um, you can look him up on Facebook and he's just um, a general do-gooder um, and collects old photographs of the area and shares them uh, very generously with people. Uh, one of the images in the book we get a lot of comments on is this lovely hand-colored lithograph of downtown Aurora. This is actually a piece I had in my personal collection and was used in the book. And once the book is designed, we actually had these digitally printed at the Finger Lakes Press in Auburn and they did a great job. And they give me just a stack of printed papers um, and there's a lot of paper cutting. This is a big paper cutter in my shop and various work that goes into actually making that into a book. This is a gluing machine uh, because we wanted this book to have a relatively affordable cost. They're glued together rather than sewn. So this is the gluing machine. Uh, this shows examples of some of the interior of the book. And here is Claire and I and my shop with one of the finished books. And if anyone's interested in the book, um, they are available through the Village Market. This is Claire's contact information if you have any questions for her. And if you want to know more about me or ask questions, um, my website's at the bottom. Uh, for those of you who are on Facebook, I encourage you to find me and like my page, and then you'll find out what's going on. So um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, you both of you. These are fantastic. I've actually um, worked with Rob a little bit to buy some things for the college and his stuff is just all so beautiful. Please check out his website. Everything's so gorgeous. 
Um, and I was chatting on the side with an alum who wanted to read some of the details on the slides more. So would it be okay, Claire and Rob, if I email you after and get copies of the slideshows to, could I share those with folks who just didn't get to read enough of the details or wanted to take another look? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so we have a few minutes if anybody wants to do any Q and A's. Um, there are some, um, uh, just a few comments, but it looks like mostly tech issues. We had a lot of tech issues today across the board, <laughs> like one of those days. We experienced many of them here. <laughs> yes, I, it was not just you, <laughs> like one of those days, but I'm glad you all made it. So um, yeah, you can either ask a question directly if you'd like or put one in the chat and I can help um, make sure Rob and Claire see it if anybody has any questions or comments. I'll just say too, if anyone comes to Aurora and would like to visit me at my shop, uh, you can just email me like a day or two ahead um, because I am teaching at Wells. I'm not at the shop all the time, so it's good to make an appointment. Uh, but I love to have visitors and show what I'm doing. Sometimes I feel a little bit like a hermit in there oh. with just my animal friends, so it's always nice to have uh, visitors. Awesome. And Mary said that the book is beautiful. Love the end papers. I'm definitely interested in, in connecting next time I'm there, Rob. I, I love everything you do. I want to have more workshops where people can come do, you know, print some greeting cards or whatever and, and uh, shell out some dough and, and learn a little something at the college too. We can definitely talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Claire and Claire and Rob, this is Lisa. It's such a wonderful talk um, you gave tonight and always great to see each of you. Claire, you were saying that, you know, someone thought that you might have need, needed something to do, but I know you to be one of the most generous people and villagers. You're engaged in so much that's going on. Can you talk a little bit more about what inspired you um, at this point to really write this book or share this information? Yes. And I've lived in Aurora, as you know, Claire, for 44 years, and thank you. I learned a lot tonight. Good, good. I'll tell you exactly what prompted me to do this. Um, on the planning board, we have to get so many hours of instruction every year. And I suggested that we needed to know more about housing styles, architectural styles. And I meant I intended to be a student but I was assigned the job of teaching the rest of the board. So I had to go and, and brush up on this. And I found myself just fascinated. I couldn't go anywhere without saying, oh, that house is built about 1800. This one is, oh, this one. You know, I was just wild about it. And then I found myself locked up and thought, and I went to the libraries looking for a book on Aurora and the architectural styles, and there wasn't one. That's right. And so I suggested to Linda Schwab that she should write one. And she said she wasn't going to do that. And, uh, and I said, I think I will. And um, thanks to Rob, we did. Oh, well, lucky for us. It's just a great reminder that to be a uh, learner is to be teacher. To be teacher is to be learner. So exactly. Claire, that's wonderful. And so great, Rob, uh, to see you. I want to let everyone know Rob uh, took book arts classes with my Wells daughter, Annie, who graduated in 2008, and then some years later designed and letterpress printed her wedding invitations. Oh, so we really? have, and I, I use your bookmarks every day, Rob, among other things that I had, treasures I have from your shop. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think this one was quite a long process to come up with this book. But Claire worked on it for a very long time and it sort of snowballed into, I think a lot more than we originally thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, so. Mary sent me a copy of the book and we intend to use it as a guide when we get back to Aurora next summer, just for a visit. It's not our reunion year. Can't wait okay. to see it. Wonderful. Great. I just shared my email again in the chat, just in case anyone missed it. Um, alum office at wells.edu is the easiest. Our porter also works. 
Um, but if anybody wants to connect with Claire or Rob or just wants the slides or just has questions about future learning by the lake, any of anything. Um, yeah, do we have any other questions or comments? I love it. I, the history is so cool. I was texting Lisa the other day. I was on a practice with uh, with Claire and some of my teammates and Taylor House popped up and I'm like, it was her birthday. I was like, I've had some good times in that house having you dance parties did. with you. <laughs> We've had some great times. It was wonderful to see the old um, pictures of the dining room, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just all and yeah. so many, so many memories and so many buildings just having yeah. been a student there. Um, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you both so much for making this happen and sharing your knowledge and for showing up, especially on a weird tech day for all of us. Um, thank you for everybody and shoot me an email or give me a call at the college if you have any questions. And um, Rob and Claire, I'll follow up with you. Um, we're going to post this to our college's YouTube page and um, that'll be available there if anybody wants to see it there. And um, yeah, just reach out if you need anything. I really appreciate it. Our next one in October will be um, around the same time. It'll be the second week, uh, second Wednesday of the month. So be on the lookout for that. Okay, thank you all so much. Have a great thank night. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful to see everyone. Nice to see you.